recording. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the Environmental Defense Fund's EU Reduction Manual, a guide for fishermen, fishery managers, and member states. We're very glad you all could make it today. Uh, this is Nick Weiner from the uh, from the from Open Channels, and co-hosting this webinar with me is Sarah Carr from the EVM Tools Network. Uh, presenting for us for us today, sorry, I could not talk this morning. Uh, presenting for us today from EDF are Carly McElwain, McIlwain, and Eric Lindevo. I'll be handing the mic over to them in just a second so they can introduce themselves. Uh, a few technical notes to mention in the interim, though. Uh, so this webinar is being recorded. I'll post it on openchannels.org in a few hours. Uh, if you click the little reddish orange arrow in the top right hand corner of your screen, you'll be able to show or hide your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, in that control panel, there's a question section. Anything you type in that question section will be relayed to Sarah and myself. Uh, and then we'll save those questions to the end of the webinar um, and get those answered for you. Uh, so if you have any questions at all, anytime during the webinar, just type them into that panel and we'll get them. Uh, if there's any clarifying questions, we can you know, pause temporarily and get those through right away, but otherwise we'll hold them to the end. Uh, and with that, I will hand the mic over to Carly and Eric. Thank you so, so much for presenting for us today. Uh, thank you for that, Nick. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric, and thank you for allowing Carly and myself the opportunity to, to present today. Uh, I work with the Environmental Defense Fund as a senior consultant for the EU Asian program. And I'm Carly McElwain. I am the Client Engagement Manager for the EDF Fishery Solutions Center, a team focused on the design and development of innovative fishery management tools and strategies that reverse overfishing and restore oceans to abundance. We have expertise in the fields of policy, science, training, markets, supply chain, fishery finance, and more. With this, our with this, our novel Fishery Solutions Center is able to provide insight on improving local fishery performance. Both Eric and myself have been leading the development of the EU Discard Reduction Manual with key input from our team members. As some of you know, Environmental Defense Fund is becoming an established global NGO. We believe prosperity and environmental stewardship must go hand in hand. And we're also optimists because we have seen our ideas make a huge difference and we build strong partnerships across interests to ensure practical solutions and lasting success, guided by both science and economics. And we see fisheries in Europe as really no different to this. And we recognize the landing obligation as one of the biggest challenges to come out of the common fisheries policy reform. Reducing discarding, which is the, in essence the practice of throwing fish overboard, is a crucial component of achieving sustainable fisheries in Europe. And we really had to see how to address, how to sort of work towards ending wasteful discarding and promoting sustainable fisheries management in the EU, but at the same time ensure that fishing jobs in communities aren't adversely or unnecessarily impacted. And I personally realized that something sort of really needed to be done when two fishermen that we work with recently told me that, that well, if we're going to stick to the rules next year when the domestic fisheries are phased in, into the landing obligation, then well, we'll probably have to stop fishing within a month, which is quite clear, clearly not of our interest. And today we'd like to talk a little bit about the things that we think can assist the implementation process and, and about the guide that our organization has put together. And we hope that this will sort of start to address some of the systematic, systematic challenges presented by the regulation that we have. And for example, uh, moving from a system of landing quota to catch quota may uh, lead to the increased rates of fish conditions, especially if the bycatch quota for the unwanted species is a scarce commodity. And here we think, for example, that the role of smart quota management can become very important under those circumstances, both from a local and national point of view. And as I said, we're not really interested in forcing fishermen to go bust, uh, nor are we interested in pushing them to, to break, them, break the law. And we, we do actually want them to, both them and their community, communities to sort of economically prosper, even with the landing obligation. But we do want to significantly reduce discards and see an effective implementation of the new CFP. Uh, and in that process, we're working directly with the fishermen, it's really a must. But if we look at sort of the, the situation that we're in, uh, research has shown that on, on average 40% of North Sea domestic fisheries catch was discarded between 2010 and 2012 
and other studies considered that annual discards amounted to almost a quarter of the total EU fish catches. So clearly we have to do something about this. And as again, as mo most of you know, the landing obligation that we have uh, in the in law we have today essentially states that all species under quota must be kept on board when caught and then later on recorded, landed and counted against the relevant catch limits. And it also applies to the catches of species subject to minimum size restrictions in the Mediterranean, for example. And, and we think it's a step in the right direction for sustainability because of the economic and environmental waste that discarding entails. But for sure, there's no doubt that it, it is a challenge and it will be challenging for especially for fishermen and member states to implement in the coming years. Thank you, Eric. Hi, everyone. So you're not expected to read everything on the slide right now. The infographic is meant to illustrate the manual's top line content and show examples of problems that may be able to help you with. Specifically, the, dark, the top dark blue section asks questions to help you understand the improvements in the use of quota may help reduce discarding, while the bottom part asks questions to help you understand if improvements in selectivity and avoidance could help in reducing discards. For example, as a fisherman or producer organization, you might not have enough quota to cover catch you would have previously discarded, and perhaps you're worried that a choke species situation will arise for your fleet or country. Choke species reach your quota capacity more quickly than other species in mixed fisheries, meaning operations have to shut down even while fishermen still have access to valuable quota. If you were in this situation, you would go to our chapter on smart quota tools. Alternatively, for example, there is little or no communication on areas of high juvenile catch or your target species are managed by minimum landing sizes rather than catch limits. Then you would turn to the selectivity and avoidance solution chapter. Some cases, both of these scenarios may describe your situation and a hybrid of both smart quota tools and selectivity solutions may be needed to meet the needs of your fishery. The manual is intended to be adapted for your particular situation. I should also note that some of the tools offered in this guide are similar to what is offered under the CFP exemptions. For example, our guide includes quota rollovers and weighted transfer of quota, which are effectively the same thing as banking and borrowing and interspecies quota flexibilities. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel with some of our solutions. Rather, we are demonstrating how they can work in practice using real life examples of where they have been successful on the water, as well as what lessons can be taken from their application. Uh, thanks, Carly. Um, before we dig deeper into the manual itself, I'd just like to complete, sort of complete the scene setting a little bit. And again, as some, most of you know, the regulation that we have is being phased in, beginning with all pelagic species and species in the Baltic Sea earlier this year in 2015. And this will extend to demersal species in all areas between 2016 and 2019. In the regulation, we also have a raft of exemptions available intended to ease some of the practical implementation of the regulation. And there are also rules and restrictions on how undersized fish can be marketed, for example. And we've also seen in recent, uh, recent months how regional member state groups with input from the relevant advisory councils have also finalized their recommendations on how the landing obligation should be phased in as of next year for the more complex situations in commercial fisheries. And these have been uh, submitted and they're now currently being analyzed and will hopefully be approved by the European Commission later in the autumn. And I guess perhaps with some, some minor modifications or major modifications, we'll have to see. But uh, whatever the precise details of the finally adopted regional approach, we certainly look forward to sitting down with, with the stakeholders concerned and really discuss real on water challenges and some of the potential solutions. And of course, we can already begin to learn from the ongoing implementation going on now in, in the pelagic and the Baltic sea fisheries. And yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time going into the detail about the raft of challenges that come with the learning obligation, such as the legal interpretation and the ambitious timeline. Uh, these have been more or less settled uh, by now by the regional groups and their work. But perhaps worth mentioning here, if, from our point of view, is the current lack of, still lack of flexibility in the technical measures framework that dictate daily fishing oper operations all across the European Union. And indeed, we, we hope that there will be an effective overhaul of the current technical measures uh, regulation 
in favor of a more flexible, regionally adaptable and results-based framework where greater industry innovation can provide a basis for efficient ways to, to implement the landing obligation. And we all, equally, we also think it's critical that this is supported by a good uh, sort of fisheries governance, both at the EU and at national level, to really create that enabling framework necessary for success. And of course, un underpinned by robust science and effective control and enforcement. And we also can't neglect that we need to take account of the specific practical issues such as limited on vessel storage of additional catches and cost of handling and disposing of catches for, that will not be for human consumption. And here I think we perhaps need to find sort of rather more immediate uh, solutions that need to be found uh, really to, to allow the fishermen and member states to, to put all of this into practice. And in the end, uh, we're here at the Environmental Defence Fund because we want the help. And I think we all realize that this is going to demand our best work, probably to date. And we believe our guide is a, is a useful resource and starting point for building on past experiences in other fisheries uh, and adapting to help inform European fisheries in the process of, of trying to reduce the risk of uh, But now I'll sort of leave it to, to Carly again to explain in a bit more detail how we see the, the specific tools in the manual, how we think they can offer opportunities in meeting many of these challenges. Thank you, Eric. This is the basic structure of the guide. In the first column, you can see the tools for smart use of available quota as discussed, followed by a second column of tools for selectivity and avoidance. Just to reiterate, the guide is intended as a practical working document, outlining well-known tools used in Europe and elsewhere that have proved to be beneficial while trying to reduce discards. We are aware that many are already in operation around the EU and that some are offered as a part of the legislative exemptions. We are looking to expand our ideas and work with partners to further increase the uptake and use of these tools in European fisheries. Member states and industry should feel encouraged to sit down together to find ways to reduce discards and better match catches to quota. A robust governing framework is essential for this to happen and there should be opportunities at local, national, regional, and the European level to share knowledge on ways to match quoted to catches. Pilots will also be fundamental to understand how solutions can be applied and improved, and funding must be available to support the introduction and success of on-the-water pilots. It is important to note that these tools are not exclusive to rates-based management, also known as RBM, and can also be implemented in both RBM and, and non-RBM fisheries. Before I go into more detail about the tools themselves, I'd like to take a moment to elaborate on what we mean by rates-based management. RBM provides the fishing industry with an important right mix of rights, responsibilities, and rewards. In RBM programs, fishermen, fishery cooperatives, and communities are granted a secure, exclusive access to a fishery in which appropriate controls on fishing mortality are established, where RBM participants are held accountable to these. NARBM quota programs, a share of the catch quotas provided in return for full accountability in meeting the catch limits. While in RBM area programs, participants are provided secure and exclusive access to the fishery through an area concession, which is often called a territorial use right for fishing, or TURF for short. And in return, um, their participants will meet full accountability on the controls for fishing mortality that will ensure long-term sustainability of the stock. In these types of fishery programs, we see greater trust provided in fishermen as they are held accountable to their individual actions, meaning fishery managers cannot close a fishery simply because a single vessel has exhausted its quota. This creates important flexibility in the system where rules can be tailored specifically to the needs of the fishery. Importantly, it moves away from the complex, micromanaged fisheries with often with frustrating effort controls such as days at sea, which can incentivize regulatory discarding. In contrast, fishermen and fishery managers and rates-based management programs operate under more accountable, flexible systems where participants can make decisions based on individual or collective business plans, and managers can tailor fishing regulations to the specific needs of a fishery. We also see fishermen become steward of the resource under these types of programs, because it is now in their best interest to do so when their incentives are aligned. RBM, therefore, has an important 
part to play in ensuring the landing obligation is effectively implemented, and its benefits should be fully understood in relation to the effective implementation of the landing obligation. The approaches um, outlined in the Smart Manage uh, Toolbox is what we'll discuss now, and the first one is interspecies flexibility. Interspecies flexibility substitutes one species quota to cover the catch of a different species based on a weighted formula, and typically allows the more valuable species quota to be treated for a larger amount of quota attached to a less valuable species. In this way, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio for quota exchange. And in the landing obligation, a limit of 9% of the target species is mentioned, and the non-target species involved in the substitution must be within safe biological limits. Indeed, we have just learned that in order to give member states and fishermen more clarity on the mechanism, the European Commission will in the upcoming months draw up a list of species that are eligible for interspecies flexibility. I'd like to also say that robust science and effective monitoring will be essential with this tool. Banking and borrowing, or quota rollovers, allows a portion of the catch quota for a species belonging to a member state to roll over to the next year. Under the CFP, member states already have the flexibility of a 10% rollover. However, we believe that even greater benefits can be realized by implementing this method at individual fishermen or vessel level, as fishermen would then have greater freedom in planning their harvest each year. For example, they may decide to over or under harvest their quota as a part of their business model. Banking and barring could also prove extremely helpful should a fisherman be unable to fish to capacity due to bad weather conditions, or if they have a disaster haul, which is a single haul made up of mostly choke species and exhaust an individual annual quota allocation. The primary concern when creating rollovers is that the overage and underages of quota are recorded and enforced over the whole fishing season. Real-time data collection systems will be especially important when applying banking and borrowing to individual fishermen or vessels. Risk pools are a tool through which fishermen cooperatively pool their species quota together, and this allows them to access quota without having to purchase it on the open market. The solution essentially acts as an insurance policy for vessels and relies on and increases trust between the fishermen working through the cooperative approach. It has successfully been used for the ground fish trawl fishery on the west coast of the United States. The next tool are buffer quotas, and these are portions of individual member state or community quota units, which are set aside from the total quota to be released by the member state or the community quota group when it is deemed necessary. For instance, it could be used where choke species become an issue. This tool has again been used in the west coast of the United States groundfish IFQ fishery, in which the program has a set aside of 10% of quota for uses of adaptive management and public trust purposes. This can be used for a range of issues such as discard issues, choke species, and for new entrants. In the Danish demersal ITQ fishery, Managers have implemented a system of quota set-asides to promote specific social goals, including access for small-scale coastal vessels and new entrants for the 17-meter and under fleet. Transferability of quota can be permanent or temporary and allows fishermen or groups of fishermen or member states to sell, lease, or swap quota to align quota holdings with the composition of the catch. It's important to note that transferability can appropriately be designed to meet the specific goals of a particular fishery. For example, limits and effective trading restraints can be introduced within the system to avoid monopolies or aggregation of quota into the hands of few. This may be useful where there are strong social goals within a fishery. In these fisheries, transfers may be limited within a cooperative type system where quota is retained within a certain local or regional area. There also could be one-way valves introduced where small-scale fishermen are able to acquire quota from larger operations, but larger operations are prohibited from, requiring, from acquiring quota from small-scale fishermen or collectives. It is critical to note that good design in a fishery program can ensure that effective controls are in place so that the fishery may meet its goals. This is important for retaining the social fabric of fishing communities, which are widespread throughout the EU. The, the Alaska Halibut and Sablefish Fixed Gear IFQ program 
is an example of a fishery that allows for both permanent and temporary transferability. This program includes strict consolidation caps and eligibility requirements and transferability restrictions based on vessel length and capacity in the design to ensure that the historic structure of the fleet stays the same. Since implementation and with these design considerations, um, the fishery has been able to prevent corporate ownership of the fleet and has been able to maintain the historic fleet and participant structure. The last smart quota management tool I will discuss today is Dean Values. Dean Values requires fishermen who land species for which they do not have quota to, to pay a pre-agreed fee to the government. This is a tool that has been used in New Zealand fisheries and has been shown to be particularly useful for multi-species fisheries in which it can be challenging for stakeholders to always have the right mix of shares for their catch. So this group of tools I just discussed can be used to improve the management of quota to be more efficient while at the same time achieving the goals um, of a particular fishery while reducing discarding. Now I'm going to transition to our second group of tools. This next set of tools can be used in conjunction with quota management programs but also could be used in fisheries that are not governed by quota. This set of tools focuses on the changes that can be made in the day-to-day -day operations of the fishing industry on the water and can be implemented in quota managed or area rights-based management fisheries where catch limits are not used but where other forms of mortality, fishing mortality controls are used. This set of tools will be important when applying the landing obligation to fisheries that are targeting non-quota species and later in our presentation Eric's going to tell you a little bit about how we're engaging with partners in small-scale fisheries in Spain to apply these tools and meet the landing obligation in a non-quota context. The first set are avoidance measures where fishermen employ techniques that could help reduce their discarding by avoiding certain areas, including fishing at different depths, gear switching, and temporal changes. This has been used successfully in the BC halibut fishery where rockfish was a choke species for fishermen. By changing the depth at which they fished and actively avoiding hot spots where the species aggregated, fishermen were able to reduce the species as a bycatch and continue to fish for their target species. We also discussed technological advancements that could help improve the selectivity of gear, which will be highlighted in one of our case studies presented later, later on, so we'll go into more detail. Real-time spatial and temporal closures are ad hoc temporary closures that avoid areas with high juvenile catch rates or hot spots of choke species. This was used in the Scottish Conservation Credit Scheme, which was started in 2008 to reduce cod discards in the North Sea and close certain areas to avoid cod spawning aggregations and areas of high cod density. The closures worked on a real-time rolling basis or were done seasonally or permanently, depending on the need. So those are a group of tools. And in the manual, we also provide real-life examples for practical insight and there are no doubt further relevant initiatives in the pipeline as we speak. In general, the more best practices exchanged between stakeholders, the better. It's also invaluable to share stories of what hasn't worked and why. So we're going to go into detail about a few of our case studies. I'd like to reiterate that discarding is not only an issue in EU fisheries. We see fisheries affected by these difficulties across the world. My most recent experience took me to Kodiak, Alaska just over a month ago to participate in a work group focused on the Gulf of Alaska groundfish trawl fishery. With an early season closure at the beginning of May, which was due to reaching a hard cap of Chinook salmon, stakeholders including community members, fishermen, processors, and NGOs have been working together to tackle the issue of bycatch effectively and implement a reform in the fishery management system. Together, they're working through these issues, articulating the goals they would like to see their fishery meet, and learning from other fisheries that have faced similar challenges. The first of the case studies we'll be reiterating today is a long-established success story. We have selected this example as it highlights um, improved quota management, improved selectivity, and cooperation between industry members. The Whiting Cooperative is an industry-led rights-based management program in the catcher processor, processor sector of the U.S. Whiting fishery. <coughs> Excuse me. 
It was established in 1997 by three seafood companies made up of 10 vessels with the goal of ending race for fish conditions while also reducing discard waste and improving the economic efficiency of the fleet. The cooperative negotiated between themselves secure allocations of the total catcher processors quota without a policy initiative and each individual company member was provided this allocation. All the sectors joined and became fully accountable to their allocated proportion. <clears throat> this scheme included selectivity constraints in fishing grounds where the fleet could only target areas of lighting schools with lower concentrations of bycatch. Such flexibility would not have been possible in the past because vessels were operating under derby conditions with the constant threat of early closures because of quota exhaustions. The fleet also introduced rolling hotspots, and this means that real-time catch data is transmitted and analyzed to understand if an area has high concentrations of unwanted species. If the report shows that the area does, then it becomes a temporary closure and the cooperative's vessels are no longer able to fish there. Meanwhile, all the catchers are monitored through 100% observer coverage. This example is so compelling because through the selectivity and quota management changes made in this fishery, participants were able to reduce their discards to less than 1% of the cooperative's widening catch. For some species, such as the yellow-tail rockfish, reductions have been even greater. It demonstrates that fisheries can still be viable and even more efficient when changes are made by fishermen for fishermen in exchange for full accountability of their fishery. Okay, thank you, Carly, for that. Um, back in Europe, we have, of course, also seen very promising developments. Uh, project 50% in the UK, for example, is, is further proof that it's possible to reduce discarding while achieving and maintaining economic success within a fishery, building on improvements in both gear selectivity and industry innovation. This project began in 2009 when a pilot project was developed between the Devon Beam Crawler Fleet and the UK scientists aiming to reduce juvenile fish discards by 50% in the English Channel fishery. And prior to this, the Devon fleet in particular had one of the highest discard rates among UK fishermen. And fishermen identified barriers to reducing discards and created a platform for beginning to address them with, with the government support. And actually top-down gear restrictions were identified as the most significant issue preventing discard reduction. And the project then provided an opportunity to remove these and allowed fishermen to individually experiment with gear modifications to improve selectivity. And this was, of course, based on knowledge and, and years of fishery experience. And impressively, at the end of the project, there were 11 different modifications in both mesh size and trawl structures, and they actually reached a discard reduction rate of 52%. And, and we believe that there's now genuine hopes within the industry for legislation which will allow for further selectivity in this regard. And building on that, you may also want to have a look at uh, Cornish fisherman David Stevens' blog that was just published this week, should you wish to consider the related issues of flexibility and selectivity in, in more depth. And we've provided the link to, to the blog on, on, on the slide here. And David's uh, family fishing company based in St. Ives, the, the Crystal Sea, uh, took part in a recent UK catch quota trial. Uh, and this trial afforded him a small increase in quota with increased flexibility in exchange for full documentation. And through experimentation with mesh sizes, which would have been disallowed if not for the support of the UK Fisheries Agency, the Marine Management Organization, the fishery was actually able to average around a 90 to 95 percent reduction in haddock juveniles after there was a huge influx um, of ju haddock juveniles uh, in the stock last year. And I think that's quite impressive. And again, that, that in, underpins some of my earlier remarks about needing an effective overhaul of a way that we actually technically micromanage fisheries in the past, and, and we still do. And I think it also demonstrates the need to see more examples like David's so fishermen elsewhere can be inspired by his story, and also for fisher managers to think about how examples like this might be applied and scaled in other fisheries. So this case study is not included in our manual, but we want to share it as um, one of the most recent success stories that shows the possibility of operating successfully under a discard ban. The Gulf of Mexico Reefish um, Shareholder Alliance is a fishery organization run by fishermen on behalf of fishermen. 
And many of these fishermen are quota holders in the Red Snapper IFQ program. And after major issues of Red Snapper discards in the Gulf grouper, fa uh, grouper fishery had become apparent, the fishermen of the Alliance came together to form the quota bank, aimed at reducing these discards and achieving a revenue, a sustainable revenue stream for those involved, while at the same time building membership through demonstrating incentives. And the quota work bank works by uh, fishermen partners pooling the red snapper allocation and then leasing it to the group of fishermen in Florida. And this is done um, so they're able to account for and land the red snapper that they catch on their grouper group trips. In return, the quota bank members agree to work on avoiding these species and they also agree to recording their catch information within 24 hours of landing. The members also promote the quota bank as an effective tool for addressing a key problem. In the first year, it's estimated that over 13,500 kilos will be transferred between the fisheries under the quota bank. And it's hoped that the quota bank can help fishermen promote conservation, improve fishery access, and deliver accountable fishery solutions. Okay, well, that, that is more or less the nuts and bolts of, of our manual and the toolbox and the examples that we have. Uh, and before we wrap up, I'll just like to sort of conclude by telling you a bit about our next steps. We clearly want to engage with fishermen, fishery managers, and anyone else who are seeking ways to implement the landing obligation. And, and we believe the tools and examples that we have offered in the manual will add value to the current discussions. And we want, want to be part of the solution by sharing what we hope is a helpful resource. And we would, of course, love to be put these tools into practice and would happy to speak with people offline on your ideas for how this guide can be used practically and to good effect. Um, but uh, yeah, we're already engaging on these issues. Um, for example, in Sweden, we've helped recently to set up fishing and industry working groups to develop recommendations for a new quota management system. This initiative offers a platform that engages the co-management principles of government agency and industry participation and actually allows for an inclusive and transparent multi-stakeholder process. And if we look at our, in relation to our manual, uh, some of the key issues that are being discussed within these working groups include sort of questions such as, can temporary quota transfers really help fishermen meet the landing obligation requirements? Or how can we limit the risk of shutting down the entire fleet and or limit fleet rationalization? And then, of course, one of the big questions, what about initial allocation? How can we enable everyone who wants to keep fishing be able to do so in the future? And are there specific considerations that we need to take account of surrounding the coastal fleet? And this work is still very much going on. And as mentioned by Carly earlier, in, in Spain we're also partnering with WWF Spain to, to walk towards uh, sustainable fisheries management for, for the small-scale coastal fisheries in, in Spain. And here the second set of tools can particularly be particularly useful, I would say, in looking for both innovations in selectivity. And, and other avoidance measures. And as Spanish coastal fishermen are organized into the regional fishing guilds or the Cofradías, here again we're talking about co-management and that will really be a key element of success. And we think that bringing these fishermen to the table when making decisions on, on fisheries management will help to empower fishing communities to remain prosperous well into the future. But before we completely conclude, there's just some final remarks uh, that I would like to mention. Um, I think you, you probably understand that through, we, we really believe that greater flexibility in the system is crucial if we're to eliminate regulatory discarding currently created by existing technical rules at the EU level. And that will require a move away from prescriptive input controls in exchange for increased accountability either through remote electronic monitoring or, or other methods such as self-reporting or onboard observers, for example. And we also think that if, if we couple this with robust quota management and enhanced industry stewardship, we think this can be even more effective. And also included in, in, in the slide here, we have a link to an extremely comprehensive accountability roadmap put together by our, our colleague Sarah McDee, who worked with other, uh, other people outside our organization. And it really deserves to be shared uh, with you today, and I strongly su sort of suggest you to have a look at this. Another point is, is documentation. Uh, documentation is certainly an area of, of interest that we think can help inform better science and data, and, and there's a lot of experience already out there. 
uh, especially with industry-dependent data increasingly being used to help inform stock assessments, for example. And incorporating industry-dependent data is, is certainly a major benefit that could potentially be gained from fully documented fisheries. And in the manual itself, but, but well, we haven't presented it today, but we also have the Danish traceability system as another illustrative example uh, showing where full accountability and full documentation can be applied in practice with a very good effect. And that really achieves a fully accountable fishery allowing for the, the tracking of fish from the harvesting vessels onto to the docks and fish buyers, processors, retailers, and finally to the, the end consumers. We've also mentioned the, the use of pilot projects, and we think pilots can help us understand how to work out some of the specific problems of the landing obligation and how some of the solutions can be applied and adapted according to the specific needs of, of the fishery concerned. Uh, pilots uh, could, could support new ways of working where, again, such a greater flexibility and results-based approaches uh, in technical measures are supported through European funding, uh, such as the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, uh, which, as most of you know, is our main public fund that primarily aims to make the, the CFP a practical and working reality. And I'd really like to reiterate that while some of the ideas that we discussed today, uh, or that we'll discuss in pilots, may, may seem radical now, they may actually later become very standard practice and a regular mode of operation. And our tools can help with this transition, we think, and help finding ways that work for fishermen, fishery managers, and, and the environment, of course. And as with any type of sustainable fisheries management, collaboration uh, is key and participation between stakeholders is key especially from the sector, it's, and that is really critical to being able to adapt these tools to the EU context. Um, and I just want to reiterate that the manual is a starting point uh, for discussions on how to tackle these immense challenges together. We don't see it as a magic wand by any means, but a set of tools that have been proven to work um, in fishery management while addressing discards and that we can adapt and utilize these tools to be more useful in this context for achieving fishery management goals in the EU. I also would like to say that it's important to remember that good design coupled with stakeholder engagement and solutions are key to meeting the landing obligation. So thank you everybody for listening to the presentation, which we hope you have all found interesting and useful. It's now time for the question and answer portion of the webinar, and I'd like to start it off by addressing questions that were submitted to us in advance by UK stakeholder Jane McPherson. Jane asked how buffer quotas and risk pools work in practice, and specifically how access for how access is managed for buffer quotas, and is there a danger that the tool would spur a race uh, to access for additional quota? I just want to say that using buffer quotas and risk pools can effectively help pool quota and, and to respond to situations where choke species limit fishery. Um, it is true that if buffer quotas are put in place without secure allocation, um, there could be issues and that clear mechanisms need to be implemented to prevent race for fish from occurring. One particular way to do this that we've seen um, is to make access to the quota, whether it be sold or otherwise available, and conditional on vessels demonstrating best practices um, fishing behaviors to reduce their discards. And that could include um, a range of activities from gear switching to other selectivity measures, participating in documentation trials such as CCTV, and participating in voluntary and spatial uh, closures. Management may also uh, prefer to allocate quota after the fishing season is closed or while the quota is or when the quota is released at the beginning of the season, um, at the start of the season, allowing only vessels that have implemented the best practices to fish while others um, are docked. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. And, and Jane also asks us if how one might limit the financial incentives offered by the existence of the risk pools. Uh, admittedly, what we feel to be a benefit of this tool is that this course sort of really works on cooperation and trust. However, a lot of the incentives that Carly mentioned in relation to buffer quotas can also work here. Uh, the main difference really is that buffer quotas are implemented at government level while the risk pools work through a voluntary formed market-driven collective entity. 
And either way, if, if the rules are adhered to, um, but a fisherman still hits a choke, they can access additional quota to cover the catch and, and still remain operation. Um, and, and yeah, and that is really what we yeah, would conclude on that point. But uh, now I'd like to turn over to the moderator so he can continue the questions and answer portion of the webinar. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you both so much. Um, so just to let everybody know again, uh, you can just click the little orange red arrow in the top right corner of your screen to pull out the GoToWebinar control panel. And then uh, just go to the questions panel in there, and anything you type in will get right away. Um, so we do have a few questions here. Um, first, a clarifying question. Uh, Hazel Curtis submitted uh, that there's a video on the business of fishing on YouTube uh, that you can watch if you want more information about the fishing industry um, in Europe. Uh, also, uh, so let's see, we have a question here. Uh, how does the manual respond to the issue of choke species? We're hearing reports that fishermen will be tied up in less than a month under the demersal discard ban. Yeah, maybe I can just quickly jump in. Well, as we mentioned earlier, um, sort of a risk pools and buffer quotas are really an excellent tool for uh, tackling some of the sort of problems caused by choke species. Um, and yeah, Carly also mentioned the deemed values and interspecies flexibility, and they can also be very effective. But maybe it's better that Carly takes, takes that question. Sure, I could dive into risk pools a little bit more. Um, risk pools, pools could prevent fishermen from ending the season prematurely. And it's based on the concept that the fishermen cooperatively pool all their species, or all, all their quota of choke species together um, based on terms and outline uses that they agree upon in a collaborative way. And that also is in the context of local policy and government regulations. And essentially, we see this as fishermen having the ability to spread risk across the collective group and provide a safety net. Um, and then participation in the pool usually is some sort of payment in the form of money, quota, or a combination. And again, it's determined at the discretion of the cooperative participants. Um, and typically, uh, joining one of these pools requires members to adhere to additional avoidance measures, such as voluntary closures or gear switching. Um, we've seen this, and I'd love to give an example of a successful risk pool um, implementation, and that's in the West Coast groundfish fishery. To give you a little bit of a background, um, in 2000, it was declared a federal disaster, and fishermen were really faced with some significant hardships. And I believe about seven species were determined to be significantly overfished, and this, um, this started a derby um, conditions, resulting in smaller and smaller trip limits for target species, massive regulatory discards, and overall just a really dire situation for fishermen. So um, fishery managers and fishermen came together, and after years of discussion and development in 2011, the fishery um, went through a reform and implemented an RBM program coupled with um, tools such as risk pools, um, so definitely a combination of tools that we have been discussing. It was not without its hardships. Um, since. I believe about seven species were extremely overfished. There were extremely low tax established. And just to give you an idea, an average allocation for one of the choke species, I think it was yellow-eyed rockfish, was around 3.5 kilograms. So that was, for the entire year, a trawl fisherman could only catch 3.5 kilograms because that was his quota, or he would have been. And once he caught it, he was out for the season. So, rightly so, fishermen were really worried that the limited availability of quota could make it difficult um, to operate the full season because it would be expensive and could put them at risk of bankruptcy. So they came together and formed risk pools, and through this collaboration, um, they also implemented gear selectivity improvements and gear switching. But four years later, um, fast forwarding four years, bycatch has been declined, has declined by roughly 75%, so huge conservation gains. Um, overfished species are rebuilding at a more rapid rate, and last year, um, 2014, 13 species were certified as sustainable by the Marine Stewardship Council, and a number of species were upgraded by the Seafood Watch Program. And the most recent update is just last week, the Canary Rockfish was officially determined to be rebuilt, and this was 40 years ahead of schedule. They were supposed to be the rebuilding plans estimated that 2057 would be the rebuilt 
year, and it became 2015. Um, and we really see that the key for this change was getting the incentive right, allowing for fishermen to be stewards of the resource, and building in accountability mechanisms. Yeah, and, and I think well, in the EU context as well, we, we touched upon the Danish domestic individual ITQ system before, but that, that is a system that covers all quota management uh, managed species in the domestic fishery, and it really allows fishermen to also to, to match catches with quota holdings retrospectively for a full year uh, through leasing mechanisms. Uh, and it, the system also requires them to sort of purchase quota for any overages for which quota are available before they resort to discarding. Um, and of course that, that system has been in place for a, for a few years now but and may need some alterations now with the landing obligation, so we'll see. Um, but of course another invaluable way to deal with choke species is to, to try selectivity measures and create uh, knowledge sharing systems uh, that we talked about earlier where fishermen fishing in, in areas where you have hotspots of choke species congregating in particular but uh, other fishermen should avoid those areas. And really building on that, the idea of fishermen sharing information is really a promising way forward, we think, to, to help implementing the landing ob obligation in particular and to sort of start tackling some of these practical issues. Yes, and one last thing I would just like to add is that um, we should also be seeking new ways to collect industry-dependent data to support what fishermen are seeing on the water and involving them in the scientific process. Um, this was done successfully in the BC halibut fishery and it brought, brought um, the fishermen and the fishery managers closer together um, because they were collecting data together um, when previously they were very much at odds. Yeah, um, so Rod Fujita from EDF is also on the line and he just mentioned uh, in a question here uh, that the U.S. Pacific groundfish fishery was able to rebuild choke species with the combination of large no trawl areas, low quotas, and discard reduction through IFQs and risk pools. Um, just to add to that. Um, so here we go, we have another question here. Um, how does the landing obligation affect bycatch of protected, endangered, and threatened species? Uh, will these species uh, have to be landed at the dock? Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another good question. Um, well, it, it depends. We're in, in respect to the landing obligation in the European Union, um, of course, the, the legislation that we, we have deals with, uh, with, um, with fish, fish species. Um, so I think, of course, when we talk about the, um, the quota management tools that we have in the toolbox, that is not going to apply necessarily to to bycatch of, of other uh, marine animals. But I think that in, in general is something that uh, we would like to work in the context of the technical measures framework, uh, which, which certainly would also integrate um, uh, other marine, marine species and where, yeah, you need, you need to find where there are problems with certain marine species and then to, to kind of uh, really figure out what kind of uh, yeah, innovation selectivity uh, avoidance measures you, you can apply there and then I think you can still go back to the manual and see um, maybe based on some of the case studies we also have have, have actually integrated the wide RICO system um, concept as well as just just for targeted or non-targeted fisheries. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Okay. Right, I would agree and I would just say that we do see oftentimes in rights-based programs that fishermen are more open to communicating and discussing um, certain areas that maybe these species are congregating and where there could be high density. So there's just more open communication, collaborative uh, efforts um, to help to help other fishermen. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another question here, uh, how do you think this manual can apply to the complex landscape of EU fisheries where many member states with different enforcement regimes may be involved in the same fishery? Um, yeah, maybe I'll have a stab at that one as well, seeing as it's it's more EU uh, dominated on EU policy. I think, as we mentioned in in the presentation, we we do re reiterate science, but also control and enforcement, and that is really a cornerstone of of any well functioning uh, management system. Um, and as we know, when it comes to shared fisheries in Europe, it's it's the main role of the European Control Agency 
in vigo to, to really get member states together to, to support uh, common control and enforcement approaches in, in these shared fisheries. Um, and of course, the approaches that we want to discuss should not work against these uh, these mechanisms. And actually, when needed, we, we would sort of like to propose any open or inclusive dialogue that we can have between all the stakeholders uh, concerned. Um, and the Environmental Defence Fund, we're also actively engaged in both uh, the Baltic Sea Advisory Council and the North Sea Advisory Councils, which of course encompasses a lot of member states and a lot of shared fisheries. And that is already a good platform where we can have some of these discussions. And, and I would say finally, we, we just had a presentation earlier this week where the European Commission uh, came out and, and talked about how they are consulting at the moment on a new control regulation or revisions of the control regulation. And it's really uh, sort of midterm review, but it's also in, in mind of, of a new CFP that we have in place and I would say in particular the landing obligation and the new sort of control and enforcement uh, approaches that might, might be needed to be tightened up to allow the landing obligation to be implemented properly. Um, and the Commission actually came out quite forcefully and uh, openly and said uh, that they, um, they want us stakeholders to uh, have blue sky thinking in this area. How can we overhaul the control regulation and make that more regionalized and more innovative and maybe more bottom-up, industry-driven? Um, and I think, given what we discussed today, I think that is certainly what we will try to do in, in, in that respect. Yeah, and I would... Oh, sorry, guys. No, that, um, we do recognize that enforcement in the EU is a national competency issue and that this may um, complicate the process of streamlining regimes across the member states. Um, but I'd like to note that cooperation between uh, neighboring member states could help strengthen regional approaches to the specific management issues. And irrespective of what management approaches are in place, it's really going to be vital that the control and enforcement of all fishermen in the same fishery or region is on a, uh, a level playing field. And I think we do believe that there's going to be a tipping point where fisheries adopting durable quota management systems coupled with fully documented fisheries will inspire others to um, adopt similar approaches when they see the benefits that can be derived to them. Yeah, and I would just sort of finish that by saying that scaling is an important aspect of, of designing any new system uh, and from the EU point of view, that's certainly from a political point of view, but also of course a scientific point of view. Uh, Carly, would you mind backing up a few slides to get back to your contact emails? Um, we have a bunch of questions and I don't think we're going to be able to get through all of them. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So here's another question here. Um, what are the options uh, for these technologies and tools to be transferred and used to build capacity within the UK and EU overseas territories? Can you repeat that one again? Sorry, I was moving through the PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. Uh, what are the options for these technologies and tools to be transferred and used to build capacity within uh, the UK and EU overseas territories? Um, so I think, I mean, I think Basically, um, engaging with EDF and with other stakeholders on the ground, um, we do have large, um, a large network of fishermen that are thinking through the process and are using these tools. And we really believe in fishermen to fishermen learning and engaging with others in similar contexts, really, where you can learn from each other is really where we see our strong point. And, that's something where how the tools can be transferred from the other context to the EU. Eric, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just say that sort of irrespective of, of where these fisheries are, um, of course, uh, there's a lot of work having been done in the United States, and now we're, this, this particular manual, manual is focusing on the discard reduction in the European Union based on the rec recent CFP reform. Um, but of course, overseas territories, uh, outermost regions of EU member states, their, whatever the structure of their fleet, if it's small scale artisanal fleets or, or large industrial scale fleets, um, my, my colleagues in other countries in, in, in the world are, are engaging with, uh, with these fishermen as well, uh, such as Indonesia or Belize or Cuba. Um, so, we, so we do have 
people in, in, in the ground in, in other other areas of the world, and I don't think this toolbox, um, yeah, maybe you're not going to have to stick to the nitty gritty of uh, the uh, sort of legal architecture of, of the discard or the landing obligation uh, of the, the CFP, but in many of the global fisheries, um, large or small, some of the challenges are very similar, which is yeah, yeah promoting uh, fishermen's livelihoods and uh, reducing wasteful discards, um, etc. So I, I, yeah, geographical lo location doesn't necessarily mean that we we are not going to be working. There. Uh, I agree. I, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, one more point that I have is, as we mentioned, pallets are also really helpful um, to think about how these tools could work in your local context. So really taking advantage of those opportunities to test out what's going to be best for your industry and for your particular context. Um, pallets are definitely something to think about. So kind of piggybacking off of this, uh, what do you believe are the factors, are the key factors for success in setting up a risk pool? Uh, is it helpful if there's government support, or should government say it of the way, or something else? Um, I think that, I think definitely um, cooperation between fishermen are helpful, and I think in experiences that we've had is um, when fishermen come together and they're able to discuss the issues and, and create a system that works for them and creates their own uh, bylaws and terms, that's really helpful. But we have seen both examples. We've seen fishermen come together from a more bottom-up um, approach, and then we've also seen governments put a mandate where they have to uh, operate together um, through a policy. Um, so we've seen both ways. We've seen both ways work, um, and I'm not sure I would say it's an either-or, and it could definitely be tailored, and it might be, it might based on your, be based on your specific context. But there's no one right answer from my perspective. No, uh, excuse me. And I, I would just add that that is very much what what my European colleagues in both Sweden and, and Spain, in particular, are working on, uh, working with this collaboration with the fishermen, be it uh, government driven or bottom up driven. And, and that is what is exciting to have all these people around the table and. Uh, you spend the half, uh, first half day talking about uh, conflict or, or almost anger management or misconceptions about uh, the, your fellow fishermen, but eventually you, you, you go to these meetings and you, they are extremely constructive and, and people are, are really making exceptional progress, both, both in Sweden as, as we speak and, and also in Spain. And, and that makes us feel that we're onto, onto something good. And, and of course we would like to work in more places like that. So it looks like we have time for one more question here. Um, is there a centralized data reporting and quota trading infrastructure in place? Uh, are there data reporting requirements standardized for fishermen and dealers across the countries? Um, I could take the first crack at that. I think it depends where. Um, in some locations, we do see um, different stakeholders uh, managing the quota. Um, Imagine, managing the quota inventories and places of uh, the registries. Um, and we see examples, um, please email me if you want specific ones, where fishermen are largely in charge of these quota registries. We've seen examples of where fishery managers and government are in charge of the registry. And we also see sometimes in cooperatives where um, there's a cooperative manager that manages the quota for all the members of the fishermen um, in a cooperative. So I think the key takeaway is that it's flexible and that it can be designed to meet your fishery goals and your particular circumstances and what you want to see your fishery meet in terms of goals and how you want to work with each other. Yeah, and uh, certainly uh, as far as I'm aware, the, the Danish uh, um, demersal ITQ system um, they, they certainly build their system on, on transparency and registration and you can go online to see who's holding what, who can you, uh, perhaps who can you lease some, uh, some white equator from uh, because you, you need it. Um, so I know that the Danish system uh, in intent has, has had, uh, had that in, incorporated into the system. And I think that is certainly what is needed if, 
if uh, if you are going to go down the road of, of having rights based management system, having the transparency um, and allowing flexibility is, is really key for, for the fishermen themselves, I would say. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for presenting for us today, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, if you have questions that we didn't get to, um, please use the contact information there on the screen. Uh, and please join us again for the next webinar we have coming up. Uh, we'll, again, post this recording on openchannels.org in about two hours. So in case you wanted to revisit anything, we'll have it up there soon. Um, all righty. Thank you all so much, and have a good day.